appreciate everyone being here and listening to what I have to say. A um, little bit about myself before I get going into what uh, uh, I'm going to talk about. And just the reason why I buttoned my suit coat is I, I got trained to do public speaking at IBM back in the IBM glory Ooh. days, okay? So it would be a cardinal sin for me to be up here with a t-shirt on, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that's why I'm up here. And, I, and that's just by habit. I just buttoned my jacket. But anyway... A little bit about myself, as you heard, I, I have a, uh, I had a professional sales career for about 14 years, working for Fortune 200 companies, and then uh, started ministry, started pastoring in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, started pastoring in a church, I uh, started pioneered a church in the neighborhood I grew up in, and the neighborhood I grew, grew up in in Chicago is always in the news now, okay? uh -huh. like, you know what's happening in Chicago if you follow the news. So anyway, pioneered a church there and really learned really about that ministry is not really about bringing people in and trying to make them or convert them into understanding who they are in God. Ministry is about connecting people with God and then giving them the tools for them to manifest a very strong relationship with God. Mm. And so from there, uh, Pioneer the Church started a school. We started a school. Our school went from pre-K, K, three-year-old, all the way through high school. We had very good success. We had our overall academic uh, ratings were 95%, and we were getting students from all types of backgrounds. But when they tested out, they were testing out by the time we, they finished our school at a 95% overall grade, grading wow. average. So we was having great success. And lo and behold, went to Phoenix, Arizona in February and of uh, some years back. February, leaving Chicago, February, right? <laughs> to look at the school career. And I took my daughter. She said, let's move here. I said, come back in August. Let me see what you got to say. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, the Lord laid it on my heart to pioneer a church in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, right outside of Phoenix called Goodyear, and that's what I'm doing right now. But uh, my background has been always been sales. So I, and what I mean by sales, I never saw sales as being sales. I saw it as benefit delivering. And, and benefit delivering, you really have to understand what somebody is looking for in order to be able to match your product. Uh, so it always calls me to think, always calls me to think. And so that's how I came up with this talk that we're going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about today, which is something that... Uh, I thought about, and I, I really believe that once you grab hold to what I'm going to talk about today, it's going to make you really understand why you are here on earth. Mm -hmm. And not only why you are here on earth, why God put you on earth and want you to have a relationship with him. I'm not trying to preach to you. I want this to come from a very intellectual point of view, which means you can really dissect the information, grab hold to the information, and it does what, uh, 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 sure, uh, I'm sorry, sure, 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 sure right, sure says about passion talk, you will have intellectual faith, okay? So, anyway, what we're going to talk about a little bit today is the opposite of God. And the key thing I want you to see here is that scripture I have up there that says, well, Paul wrote this in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, and this is the last uh, verse of that chapter. He says, let all things be done decently and in order. So, in other words, I'm going to stick with my notes here. Uh, Paul is stating that in order for the body of Christ to move things forward, listen, all things, all things in our lives need to be done and need to have these two attributes. It needs to be decent and in order. Now, decency is this. Let me get, put this out there for you. Decency is a standard of appropriateness, meaning that it's appropriate for what you're doing, being in your academic life, your family life, your spiritual life. Decency means it's appropriate. But then, not only decency, you need this other attribute called called being in order. Now, this is what order means. It's instituted and result-producing arrangement. It's instituted, which means you thought this out. And not only are, have you thought it out, you thought it out for the end. Which, what is the end? You will always produce results. The results will always be able to happen time in and time out. That's what decency and, and order mean. All things. So with that in mind, for God, the opposite of God. Because if I went around the room and say, hey, what do you think the opposite of God is? Most people say the devil or evil, some other form. But listen, in order for things from God perspective to be opposite, it can't not work against God. It has to work in conjunction with God. The opposite of whatever thing, anything that God creates has to work in conjunction with him. Why? Because all things have to be done decently and in order. All things need to have a appropriateness, and it needs to have a purpose. If it comes from God, it needs to have those two attributes. So what am I saying? I'm saying that 
It needs to work together. Let's look at this chart. God started with the male, all right? And when he decided to make humans, he, he made a man, male. Now, we can all agree that the opposite of a male is what? Female. A female, right? And what? So, it was a balance and purpose, decent and order, right? Multiplication through fruitfulness. That's what God says. We, you know, Genesis said, made, made the male and female, made them both. God blessed them and told them, be fruitful, multiply, and do everything else he said after that. They work in conjunction. They're opposite, but they're working together in conjunction. Let's look at another one. Seed time and harvest, right? Seed time is what you start with. The opposite end of seed time is harvest. Why? Because when you have seed time and harvest working together, you're going to have sustenance. But not only are you going to have sustenance, which means we're going to have more food, but also what you're going to get, you're going to get more seed. Because the whole idea of the seed is within the seed is more seeds. Well, excuse me, within the harvest is more seed for you to even have continual seed time and harvest. So let's look at one more. Day, opposite of day, we all know, is night. According to Carl, uh, my friend Carl talk, it's night and day, guys. <laughs> but anyway, it's day, then, then night. Evening and morning. Evening and morning, right. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> but why? So we can have activity within this structure called time. So the opposites of God, of God has to work in conjunction with each other. Anything that's opposite of God has to work in conjunction with God. Now, why? Now, let's look at... With that in mind, let's keep going. I'm going to stay, stay on my notes here. So, the Bible tells us in the book of uh, uh, John that God is a spirit, right? Mm -hmm. So, therefore, the opposite of God, first of all, has to have a spiritual genesis. Because God is a spirit. It has to have a spiritual genesis. The second thing, we already, hopefully I established this already, it has to work in conjunction with God. It cannot work opposite of God. It cannot work in opposition, let's put it like that. Of God. It has to work in conjunction with God. And therefore, when it has those two characteristics, we already saw that it has to release balance, purpose, decency, and an order. Okay? So, with that in mind, here's the key to understanding the opposite of God. It's when Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, now, Jesus could have said anything about how you and I are to pray as Christians, but he said this, your kingdom come. After he said, we give hollowness to the name of, of our creator. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, notice what he said. On earth, that's the root, as it is in heaven. So, in other words, it's already completed in heaven. What you and our job is, is to bring kingdom purposes here on earth. That's what we're here for, okay? That's why God placed you here. To bring kingdom purpose on earth, which means to manifest the kingdom purpose. So the opposite of God is reality. It's the real world. The opposite of anything in the spiritual realm is the real realm. And it's so important for you and I to understand and embrace this. Because when we understand that you and I are representative of the kingdom of God and God has a will that's already completed in heaven, you and I, as representatives of the kingdom of God, are called here in our respective roles and our respective purposes and our respective callings. We're placed on earth to materialize the kingdom of God here on earth. Now, I'm going to go deeper in this. A little, uh, so, uh, let's put it like this. I'm going to take it to you more individualized. But it, you, we have to understand that. Now, why is it important for you to understand that? The reason why is this. You... Sitting there in that chair, existed before your earthly existence. You existed before your earthly existence. Now listen to the scripture. Uh, this is something that David wrote, and it's one of my favorite passages of scripture. But I really want you to really grab hold of this, so you can really understand the power of who you and I are. Uh, you and I are as a material representation of the kingdom of God. This is what David wrote in Psalms one thirty nine sixteen. He says, your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written. The days fashioned for me, listen, when yet there were none of them. So according to what David wrote, that God saw your substance, all of our substance, who we are, what we're made of, our hair, our skin color, who, the lineage we was going to come to. He saw all of that before we were even put together. And not only that, but every single day that you have on, here on planet Earth, 
David said, has been written in a book with your name on it that's sitting up in heaven waiting for you to accomplish it on earth. Then Paul says this in the book of Ephesians 2. He says, for we are all his workmanship. That's talking about us all. Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepared it beforehand. Beforehand. There's another version he said he prepared them before the beginning of time. And so you existed spiritually before your material existence here on earth. And it's so important for you to grab hold on that. It's so important for you to have a full knowledge of that because when you understand that, you will definitely understand the fact that you are called to manifest God's kingdom here on earth. You and I are kingdom people. If you're part of the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, you're sure. Jesus. Anyway, can keep going. Therefore, therefore, you have access to, listen, a God-given faith. A God-given faith. You know, the Bible tells us that we all have been dealt the measure of faith. In other words, God has dealt to you the measure of faith. And I like to say it like this. Um, there was a por portion in the, in, in, uh, 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 the, in the Bible where there was a man who had a son who was terribly demonized. Brought, he brought him to Jesus' disciples. They couldn't do nothing with him. And he bring him to Jesus. And Jesus asked him a very powerful question. He said, do you believe I can do this? Now listen to what the man said. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That means that in all of our collective purposes, we can walk around believing that it can happen, but there could be a certain area that exists what's called unbelief. It didn't say disbelief. Un means no belief. No belief. I believe the measure of faith that God has given you fills in that gap. It fills in that gap. That's why faith is so important. Wherever we have unbelief, the measure of faith can drop in that gap, and then we know we can do what God has already written and fashioned for us to do even before we were here on earth. Another thing, too, and this has been really important for me, it helps me identify the tactics of steal, kill, destroy. Jesus said that the devil only comes for one, three reasons. The thief. Steal, which means take it away. Kill, which means to take the life out of it. Destroy, which means eradicate its existence. It's as if it never happened in the first place. That's the only reason he came. Now, if I know that I'm created, I've been materialized, because God has already created me in the spiritual realm before I materialize, then I recognize that if I'm trying to attest something to God that is in the ring, arena of steal, kill, destroy, that is not God. And that is not part of my purpose here on earth. That is not going to help me achieve my purpose here on earth. And therefore, I can better identify the tactics of, of, of the enemy and why of, of, of Satan or the demonic kingdom. And that is so important for you and I because the Bible tells us that he is very subtle. He's very subtle. And then lastly is this, and I'm not long winded. And the reason why I do that because I'm a pastor and I like to take up an offering, but I won't do it. But it enables all things, all things. Remember, all things decent and in order. It, it enables all things, both the good things that uh, are going on in our life and the bad things, to be shifted and mixed together to work together for good. Mm. In other words, all things. Why? Because we understand I'm here to manifest something that's already been completed. I'm here to bring on the earth a purpose that God has already laid out for me, placed inside of me, and I have the substance to make it happen. I'm already ready. Excuse me, I already have full access to it. The only thing I have to do is allow myself to go through the process of making all things work together for my good and for the good of the kingdom. Okay? And that's about it for me. Our second speaker will be. Oh, we have a question? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Q and A. Yeah. Okay. Four minutes of questions. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, okay. No, I, no, I figured no. he would get me back. <laughs> so, uh, expand on disbelief versus unbelief. What is the, the key difference there? Like, if you don't believe at all versus disbelieving, how does that activate the whole thing? 
Okay, first of all, on the first part of your question, the difference between unbelief and disbelief is disbelief means that I once had belief in it, but it's been cut away by circumstances, situations, or whatever else happens. So I once believed, but now it's harder for me to believe. Unbelief means that this is so big, I've been dealing with this so much, like in the case of, of the demonized son, I've been dealing with this so much, it's been happening since his childhood, I don't even know if I can believe this can happen. You know, and sometimes we can get a vision or a purpose in our life and God can show us something and it's, and it's so much bigger than us. Like, I don't even believe I can do this. I don't have the skill set. I don't have the background, whatever the case may be. And so that's the difference between unbelief and disbelief. Now, the key is, is how do we bridge the gap between where we are now, where, in other words, where our belief ends, and then getting to the end point of where our, of where our hope is taking us. And the reason why I say where our hope is taking us because faith needs hope. The Bible says faith is the substance of hope. It means it adds weight to hope. So how do I get to that? What I'm hoping for is I substitute faith in. Now let me tell you how do you know whether or not you operate in belief or whether or not you operate in faith. The way you know is this. Your belief, when you start doing things that shows that you are now moving beyond the limitations of what you cannot believe or what you used to believe and start moving towards what you are hoping to happen, you're starting to walk in your faith. And then the key is to continue to walk in faith because one thing about walking in faith, it is the area of unbelief or disbelief and it's the area that we want to start looking at everything that's going around and looking internally. But as the scripture says, we don't walk by faith. We walk, excuse me, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Okay? Thank you. Good question. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, you have another question? Go ahead. Well, two, one real quick. I heard you say Yeshua. Yeah. And uh, I like to say his first century name, too. So I, I, is that something you prefer to do and you kind of slip up every once in a while? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know where the audience is, but in, yeah. in ministry, I say Yeshua all the time. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But okay. also, I have one minute left. Another question about things existing before. Yes. Uh, in Romans four seventeen, where it says, where Paul writes, God calls things that do not exist as if they did. But in other words, if there's something prophetic, he's saying that they don't exist yet. But he calls it past tense. Like yes. He says, Abraham, you are a father of nations. That's that, right. Kind of what you're saying in alignment with that that it existed, but not really. But it's. It's as good as done. Exactly, okay. exactly. And one of the attributes of, of God is, uh, talks about in Revelation, he said he is and was and is to come. And so that, that takes in the full sphere that. of time. And, and that means that God is always on time, within time, and always ahead of time. He's always seeing it the way he wants it, ahead of time. And it's done to him. And, and that's why he's rested from all his work. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, just a, a quick question. You started out early on in your talk um, talking about the spiritual world and, and the real world, yes. uh, as you put it. Um, I, I guess I got a little bit confused during that part. Because okay. I see I see God the Father is involved in both the spiritual world and the real world. So I was wondering if you could help clarify that a little bit. Exactly, more. okay. So um, when, uh, when Jesus encountered, and let's go from our premise of that, when, when Jesus encountered the woman at the well, he said God is the spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so you're absolutely right that the encountering of God is always in the spiritual realm. But what happens is our job is to encounter the spiritual realm and usher it or bring it into the natural realm so that there's no separation between, for God between the natural and the spiritual realm, even though, he's, even though he is the spirit. But his whole goal is to have you and I be so connected to him spiritually that we literally become a tangible presence of God here yeah. on earth. I, I got that. I guess okay. what I'm getting tripped up is you okay. already said there's, there's an opposite between the spiritual and the, the real world. But gotcha. It could just be my, my Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and I think you're right on and that too because some, sometimes when we think of opposites, we think of in contention with each other. Mm -hmm. 
or or the flip side. That's where my mind went. Exactly. But I, now I understand that you weren't getting getting to that. Exactly. It's the conjunction. For God, He can never make God never wants anything interacting with Him in contention with Him. It always has to work in conjunction. Okay. And since we are the real world, we're the manifestors of the Spirit. Got it. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, one question I want to leave you with, and I'm not saying I want to have you answer. Based on what I just said, the opposite. What's the opposite of good, then, if it works with God? Food for thought. <laughs>